Hello and welcome to today's session on reliability. Now, before we begin, um, let's just put this into context and then we go ahead with the topic of the day. So <clears throat> now I'm sure all of you are aware of what a psychological test or a psychological assessment basically means. You all would have definitely <clears throat> covered this in the previous offline session that you all had and definitely in your education in college. So this is definitely not new. But the fact here being that a psychological test is almost like a secret weapon that psychologists have, a tool, well, not so much a secret, but since it's a tool that we use, and when we do wield this weapon, like I would call it, we want its impact to be significant. And for that to happen, this tool needs to have certain properties. <clears throat> and psychologists refer to these properties as psychometric properties. So one of these psychometric properties is reliability. So to help us understand what reliability actually is, let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you had or one of your family members had a blood test done? It could have been for blood sugar, it could have been the hemoglobin level, it could have been maybe thyroid. Or even let's say something more relatable like when was the last time you checked your weight? And <clears throat> you see the number pop up, you see the digits pop up on the screen and your reaction is that is this really my weight? And you decide, okay, let me verify it and you weigh yourself in again. And the second time that you weigh yourself, <clears throat> the same digits pop up. And you could either be convinced that this is your actual current weight or you'd be like, okay, this machine is not really working and <clears throat> this is not my actual weight. And what you'd do then is that you'd say that maybe I'll weigh myself on another machine. And if the other machine were to still give you the same result or show the same digits, the chances of you being convinced that that is your weight is quite higher. Yes? So that is exactly what we're talking about when we're considering reliability. The key term here being consistency. Now, when, okay, if you can see the slide here, <coughs> it clearly says that they are at least consistently inconsistent and that's what the graph shows. So, reliability is all about consistency in the results obtained by a specific test. So, we want to have a tool or we want to have a psychological tool that we can depend upon, whose uh, results would remain the same, no matter what circumstance or no matter when we are actually using it. Now, when we talk about consistency, consistency could be in two forms. So generally, when we talk about reliability, we talk about two categories of reliability. One refers to or one is in reference to a time. So we're talking about consistency in results across time. So that would be temporal stability. Whereas the other one that we're talking about is consistency of results that you obtain throughout the test, which is referred to as internal consistency. And you will notice that once we go ahead and look at the types of reliability, the types of reliability fall into either one of these categories. Now, before we actually move ahead to understanding what are 
the types of reliabilities there is one very important thing that we'd want to consider <clears throat> and that is understanding correlation coefficient now this becomes important specifically because based on this is how we know whether a tool is or a test is reliable or not now i won't go much i won't really be going in depth into it but just to give you an idea so that reliability is understandable in terms of how it's done and why we use it <clears throat> so obviously correlation coefficient is a statistical concept where we are actually talking about the relationship between two variables so a correlation coefficient is denoted generally denoted by the letter r small r not a capital r and it tells you about the degree of relationship between the two variables <clears throat> and obviously there are a few types of correlations and we will be looking at that but before that the correlation coefficient that we are concerned with especially in reliability is ranging from 0 to 1 now generally correlation coefficients can also be in the minus yes and i will uh, explain which one exactly we are looking at when we are considering a minus so before that now if you can see the picture here it's um an example to help you all understand what a correlation actually is now if i was a statistician i'd definitely be giving disapproving looks <laughs> looking at this picture and definitely because the axes are not labeled but nonetheless the reason why i have this here is so that we are focusing on understanding what reliability actually is and more in terms of content so okay if you look at this picture it clearly shows uh, a graph and if you see in the code above it says the blue denotes the level of snacks in the box in the bowl and the pink denotes the level of inspiration and or wit right so you can see that the person a person is writing a report or an article or an essay or something <clears throat> and having a snack i'm sure that all of you all can definitely relate to this yes so in this graph if you look on the left hand side of the graph you'd notice that the higher the level of snacks in the bowl the lower is the level of inspiration or wit and as the level of snacks keeps decreasing the level of inspiration and or wit keeps increasing so this example that you see here is actually an example of a negative relationship right which is one of the types of correlation coefficients sorry which is a type of correlation so in a negative correlation what you see is that both the variables are related but they are moving in the opposite direction exactly like in this example here so the higher the level of snacks the lower the level of inspiration and of it but as the level of snacks decreases so the lower the level of snacks in the bowl the higher the level of inspiration and of it and that makes complete complete sense because i'm sure you all are aware that when you all are snacking and doing something generally what happens is that we tend to get a little more engrossed in what we're eating and lesser in what we are actually doing in terms of work or in productivity and i am definitely not snacking while i'm recording this session so that is what you're looking at for a negative relationship 
Now this next slide that you can see here, again, you see that the axes are not labeled, but nonetheless, <laughs> the concern here actually is so that you have an understanding of what is a positive correlation. So in this picture, you see that uh, they're having a board meeting or some kind of a meeting wherein they're looking at sales data and the trend that you notice being projected on the screen says that as the sales have increased, the number of shaved heads have also increased in the company. And the person here says that we found this correlation in the data, so let's everyone take a razor. So I'm definitely glad that I don't belong to this company. And I'm sure there are a lot of you who are glad that you don't belong to this company. But nonetheless, what we're looking at here is that this is a positive correlation. So what we're saying that saying is that there is a positive relationship between the two variables, one being sales and the other being the number of shaved heads. And we're saying that as sales have increased or the higher the level of sales, the higher the number of shaved heads. And it would also go in the opposite direction that the lower the number of sales, the lower is the number of shaved heads. And that would be an example of a positive correlation. Now, I would feel completely guilty if I were to use these <laughs> as examples. So here you go. This would be a more appropriate depiction of what is a positive correlation. That's what you see on the first. So that's what a positive correlation looks like with your axis labeled. Then you have a negative correlation. And that's what we looked at in the first picture. And the last one that you see is a third type of correlation. And that's called a zero correlation or no correlation. So basically we're saying that there is no relationship between the two variables that we are talking about. So it could be like for an example, it could be the length of hair. And um, if I were to pick height, right? So we can't really say that the longer the hair, the long, uh, the taller the person or shorter the person it doesn't really go together. So that would be like a zero correlation. Like there is no correlation between the two variables. So these are the three types of correlation. Now, when we are considering the range of correlation, so obviously when you consider a positive correlation, it would be range would vary from zero to plus one. A negative correlation again would range from zero to a minus, right? And a no correlation basically means that there is no correlation. So that would be like a zero. But what is of concern for us is the positive range when we are considering psychological tests. We are more concerned about the range that goes from zero to a plus one. Now, as you go ahead, what we're going to be looking at is the types of reliability. Now that we have a clearer understanding of what a correlation coefficient is and how that would make sense for us in reliability, because that is the statistic used to denote the reliability of a test. Let's look at the types of reliability. There are four basic types. I won't be going very in depth. I'm sure you'll have done this before. So let's just quickly skim through the types of reliability. The first type that you're looking at here is the test retest reliability. Now you'll notice that um, something about these names that are given to the types of reliability is that whatever the name suggests is exactly what the reliability is about. And it's as simple as that. So if the first type that we're looking at says it's a test retest reliability, all we're saying is that to obtain the reliability of the specific test, what we're doing is like depicted in the picture, I administer the test once on a specific day then there is a short interval and then I administer the test again 
on some other day at some other time so what we're doing here is then I will find the correlation for a specific person's scores on the two different administrations or the results obtained from the two, dis two different administrations. So that's a test retest reliability and it's as simple as that. Now obviously if you consider a test retest reliability we're saying that it needs to have a time gap or there needs to be a short interval in between and generally the interval would range from anything from two weeks uh, to maybe one month two months three months but it's generally preferable to avoid exceeding six months and generally you will notice that tests don't or very rarely do tests actually exceed six months as a interval between the two administrations another thing that we need to keep in mind is that when we are developing tests for the younger population that is for the children for the children population we need to ensure that the time interval is much shorter because there is or there generally is a more rapid progressive development with age during childhood as compared to adulthood so keeping that in mind and considering that with development there's there's going to be changes in terms of maturity in terms of understanding cognitive capacities and we don't want those to be factors that would deter or bring the reliability of a test down so when we're considering developing a test for children we want to keep the time interval much shorter as compared to when we are considering developing a test for adults so obviously we wouldn't really say that any reliability or any type of reliability does not have any pros and cons it definitely does have pros and cons for using a type of reliability so let's begin with the pros for this and then we'd look at the cons so the first thing here now these are quite uh, simple and self-explanatory so hopefully you I wouldn't really be going through it as much in detail so the first advantage or pros that we're looking at is that there is equivalent content and we're saying this only because I am using the same test again in the second administration which means between the two administrations since I'm using the same test what happens is that the content is matched item to item because it's the same exact test and because I'm using the same exact test I don't really need to develop another new test to administer the second time which also makes it much more cost effective because obviously it's a pain to develop one test and if I were to develop another test during a retest that would definitely take up a lot of my time and also a lot of resources which is why it's also considered as cost effective now let's look at a few of the disadvantages of using a test retest reliability one is that it's time consuming and we're seeing time consuming in terms of administration so I require the same population to be present at a certain point in time for the first administration or first test taking and then I require the same population to be available on another day after a certain point in time for the second administration which makes it quite time consuming in terms of process to gauge the reliability because if I don't have the second set of scores I can't really get a correlation number the second thing that we're looking at is practice effect and like the name suggests or like the term suggests by practice effect uh, it's also referred to as generally we're talking about learning as well so what we're saying is that because it's the same test it's possible that some participants might remember or recall what they had learned or what they had answered in the previous test and thereby increasing the chances of them recalling the answers that they might have 
answered in the previous test. So that's a practice effect which works as a disadvantage because then we're not really measuring what is the capacity. We're basically measuring their recallability then. The third point that we're looking at as a con is the maturation of an individual. And we're saying that as individuals, we are constantly developing, progressing and maturing. So we are looking at development as also being a factor that could cause difference in scores. So I might not have understood. So if, which is why earlier I said that we want the duration of interval to be shorter and not very long. So avoid exceeding six months because the longer the duration of the interval, what's going to happen is that if, let's say, for example, I have a duration of a year, right? That would mean that the chances of maturity and development in terms of cognitive processing is much higher the second time that I take it as compared to the first time. So the chances of the results being different will also be higher. So that is considering maturation. The third point that we are considering is chance factor. Now, this is a little dicey, although we definitely need to consider it. So what we're saying is that there could be many changes in our day-to-day -day life which also tend to have an effect. But nonetheless, so since we're looking at two different administrations, the chance factor plays a very important role because whether it be development, developmental changes or uh, mood fluctuations or um, let's say circumstances, there could be changes that would occur from the first administration to the second administration and that could also lead to inconsistency in the results obtained. The last thing that we're looking at is change in the nature of the test. Now, what we're talking about here is that the first time when we administer a test, the items are completely new to the individual. But the second time when we administer the test, since we are using the same test items again in this type of reliability, the possibility that the person would remember the principle behind the test. So let's say, for example, I'm doing um, a test like Raven's standard progressive matrices that measures reasoning capacity, the general intelligence that we talk about. So the likelihood that the person has figured out the principle behind how to find or how to figure out the answer to a specific item and if the principle has been figured by the individual the chances of scoring better becomes a possibility in the second administration because in the first administration the person would have taken some time to figure out what the principle was but by the time the second administration is done the person has already figured out the principle right from the beginning. So the chances that the person would score higher is more in the second as compared to the first, which again results in inconsistency in the results obtained. So that's what we're looking at in for a test retest reliability. So we have a few advantages that work for using this kind of reliability as well as a few disadvantages. Moving on to the next type of reliability, and that's the split half reliability. And like I said, as the name suggests, what we're saying is that in a split half reliability, the test to obtain the reliability of the test, we split the test into half. Now, my next question to you would have actually been, how would you split the test into half? Like, how do I actually divide it into half and obtain a reliability? Well, we have quite a few options when you want to consider how to split the test into half. 
but the option that works the best is to look at odd and even items. And the reason why we look at odd and even items is, let's say for example, if I had split the test into half by taking first half and second half. So I have a test that has 10 items. And let's say I am developing a test on general intelligence, so reasoning capacity. And since it's an intelligence test, I would have arranged the items in such a way that they were in increasing order of difficulty so that I'm covering all levels and I get an idea of what is the level of the person in terms of reasoning capacity. So if I were to use the first method of dividing the test into first half and second half, you'd notice that the test is actually divided into easier items and difficult items. And as you would have all guessed, the reliability of one person's score on this test, where I'm correlating the scores obtained on easier items and the score obtained on difficult items, obviously my reliability is not going to be high because there is going to be inconsistency and only because of the nature of the items. So dividing the test into first half and second half doesn't really work. But if I consider dividing the test into taking all odd items as one half and taking all even items as one half, what I'm also doing by this method is that I am making sure that I have divided the easier items and the difficult items into both halves. So I'm actually averaging out the likelihood that a person would have answered an easy item and not answered a difficult item on both halves of this test. And that's the reason why it's most preferable to split the test into half by picking odd items and even items. Now, if you look at this slide, I have a small formula that's put on top. And no, you don't have to worry about the formula right now. It's there just so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So, okay, now I've divided the test into odd items and even items and I obtain a specific reliability score. Let's say the R is um, 0.53, just for an example. Now, what you'll notice is that this is the reliability of only half of the test. If you recall, I said that I had 10 items, and then what I did was I split the test into half by picking odd items on one side and even items on one side, which means now I've divided the test only five, five items and I've gotten the reliability of five items because we look at reliability being obtained from a pair of scores. So I have the reliability of, of only half the test. So that's when this formula comes into the picture is then I convert this reliability that I've ob obtained of the half of the test into the full test. And to do that, we use the formula that's there on the screen. So R here then is equal to 2R, which is two times because I want, I've divided the test into half. That's why the two, if I had divided the test into let's say four halves, then that would have been 4 into R instead of 2R, right? And that's why the formula looks like this. So that's 2R divided by 1 plus R. And that's the formula that we use to get the reliability of the entire test. Because we can't really get the reliability of the entire test just by doubling the reliability. That would not be the exact reliability of a test. Nonetheless, this is not something that you need to worry about right now. It's something that you will cover even in your statistics class when you have a better idea of how to actually go about getting the reliability coefficients. All right. 
Now let's look at the advantages of this test or this reliability type. And if you take a quick scan of the points that I've mentioned, you'd notice that the advantages on this list actually trump the disadvantages from the previous list. So what you see here then is that the split half reliability has some pros which actually fill in the gaps for all of the cons of a test retest reliability. And that's because in a split half reliability, there is only one administration of a test as compared to in a test retest reliability. So I don't need the person to sit again for another test taking in a split half reliability because I'm using one test only once and I'm dividing the scores for that one taken test. So obviously we are reducing the chances of practice effect, uh, there's lesser time that's consumed, uh, costs are saved, we are avoiding learning or recall from happening and we're also avoiding any kind of mood fluctuations that could occur because we are not having two instances of test taking and that's the reason why all of these become advantages here and all of these same points become disadvantages for a test retest reliability. And if that's the case, then what are the disadvantages of doing a split half reliability? So like we began, the division of the tests becomes the most difficult part. And how do I actually go about dividing the test? And what makes it time consuming is calculating the full reliability of the test because we begin with only half a reliability we spend more time in getting the full reliability of a test so that that bit is a little bit of a time consuming process but otherwise the major crux or concern here with using a split half reliability revolves around the division of a test into such a way that we balance out whatever is the content that we have on that specific test and that was the second type now moving on to the third type of reliability and that's the alternate forms or parallel form reliability and again like the name suggests what we are seeing here is that in this type of reliability now this is similar to a test retest but with a small change. So what happens here is that I do have two administrations but in the second administration I'm using another form or I'm using an alternate form which has content or which has items that are different in terms of presentation but content or the principle behind those items still remains the same. Okay. Now, the only upside of having an alternate or parallel form is that I don't really need to have a time interval or I don't really need to have an interval between the two administrations because I'm using two different forms of the same test. But the problem here again is that because I'm administering the test in immediate succession, sorry, not the problem. So the advantage here actually is that because I'm using an immediate succession, I get to see the reliability across forms but I don't get to see reliability across different times and that's the problem that we're looking at. So the first type that we looked at the test retest that was fitting into the first category that is the temporal stability we get reliability across time 
whereas in the second one in split half we get internal consistency that is consistency in terms of the result obtained in the items now in the third one we are looking at reliability across forms and not across time so unless and until I have an interval between the two administrations I won't exactly be covering temporal stability with the use of an alternate form reliability now again here under the advantages you'd notice that it has a very similar list but we're not really saying that these don't occur at all all we're saying is that because I'm using an alternate form I'm reducing the chances of these occurring but having said that we're not saying that we are eradicating it completely now let's look at the disadvantages right and it's pretty simple to understand so we're saying it's time consuming because I have two administrations it's going to be definitely expensive because I need to create two different forms of the same test that are measuring the same variable and has content that is similar in form and that's when we come to the third point which talks about content sampling now when we're talking about content sampling what we're saying is that there is a chance and this term basically suggests the chances in any errors that might occur or in any discrepancy in results that might occur only because one person might find that the first form let's name it form A one person might find that form A was much easier for him than form B whereas another person might find form B easier than form A and that's quite possible but because one might find a particular form easier than the other the chances that he would score higher on the form that he found easier is also higher or the tendency to score higher which then again leads to discrepancy in results because we are correlating that person's score on the two different forms and that is what we're looking at in content sampling the other difficulty that we have or what works as a con in parallel forms or alternate forms reliability is the difficulty of obtaining true parallel forms now when we say difficulty with obtaining true parallel forms what we're trying to say that is that when we develop two forms of the same test or of the same variable there are going to be differences in the difficulty of the content at some point or the other uh, difficulty in items I mean at some point or the other and which makes it very difficult to get a true parallel form so yes the idea or effort is to obtain a true parallel form which theoretically seems very plausible but practically when we go to actually implement it and develop the two different forms it's very difficult to get two parallel true parallel forms and that's one of our disadvantages the next disadvantage that we're looking at the last one is maintaining uniformity in administration and this is only because we want to avoid any kind of error or discrepancy in results that might creep in because of inconsistency in the administration so there needs to be complete uniformity in the administration which again is quite difficult to ex expect but nonetheless the attempt is always there and that is the third type of reliability 
now the last type of reliability as you can see in the picture below now if you look at the picture that blob that ink blob gives you that roshak or roshak association whereas <laughs> the man in the cartoon and those two lying on the couch gives you a very freud kind of a feeling from this comic but nonetheless this is a very clear depiction of what we are looking at in the last type of reliability and that is interrelator reliability now in interrelator reliability oh sorry interrelator <laughs> reliability what we are looking at is correlation and generally this kind of a reliability is used in creativity tests and projective techniques so what we do is an individual risk an individual's response on a specific test is given to two separate raters or scorers and their scores for that same person on each of the items is then correlated to give you the interrater reliability of a test so what we're saying is that it's used in tests that tend to have a lot of subjectivity subjectivity so when we have two different raters giving you similar scores we're saying that the likelihood that both of these raters scored it similarly increases the consistency of the result obtained and that's how we are looking at an interrater reliability so those were the types of reliability i'm hoping that it has been informative now before i finish there are a few things that i would like you all to read so the second point that you can see on the screen here is dependence on sample and this is something that we have covered when we were looking at the advantages and disadvantages so it would definitely be helpful for you all to read further to understand how the sample or changes in the sample whether it be mood like we discussed whether it be chance factors so how does the different characteristics of the particular sample have an effect on the reliability that is obtained so the dependence of the reliability on the sample is one thing that you will definitely need to read up on further another thing that you will need to read up on further is what kind of reliability would i use to gauge the reliability of a speeded test and that's the first point that you see here so by speeded tests we're looking at by speeded tests i mean tests that have a time limit so what would be the type of reliability that you would use on a speeded test now i would like to end this session today with a question for you to think upon and along with these points on further reading we will discuss this when we meet during our offline session so make sure that you go back home and read this and the question that i have for you is that how do we actually read a reliability coefficient you may recall that i mentioned the range of a reliability coefficient that we are concerned with or interested in understanding so how do i actually read this reliability coefficient what's even more significant for you all to think about is that how much reliability is adequate reliability for a psychological test thank you